This podcast is a project of Fairwinds Energy Education. Today on the show, we'll discuss some shocking news now coming out of Japan. Though it's receiving virtually no media attention, a recent story by one Japanese news outlet has exposed what some cleanup contractors are doing with nuclear waste to make it quietly disappear. Also, more trouble for the Fort Calhoun plant as an NRC inspection report reveals that the plant's quality assurance data is in a state of disarray. Finally today, we'll discuss the findings of a financial analysis conducted by UBS Financial on the viability of some plants operating in the U.S. Joining us as always to discuss these issues is Fairwinds Chief Nuclear Engineer Arnie Gunderson. Well Arnie, not only is it now a new calendar year, but uh, it's a new year for you as well. Yeah, that's right. My, uh, my birthday is January the 4th and I celebrated my 2 to the 6th power birthday. And I'll let the mathematicians among you um, to figure out what that, what that means. But on my birthday, two truly appalling nuclear events occurred, or at least came to light, that I was hoping to talk about this week. The first one is in Japan. And within Japan is making uh, a lot of people angry. It's certainly a, a true scandal. And within Japan, a lot of people are, are, are very, very concerned. The mainstream media in the United States hasn't covered it, but it is a, a real big deal. And Arnie, you're talking now about a recent Japanese news article, uh, an expose, which shines the light on some Japanese cleanup contractors who, instead of bagging this radioactive waste, have taken it and dumped it into different places in the environment. Now, they were recently documented doing this. Yeah, you know, I, I have to, the Japanese news coverage has not been very good, and there's been a lot of political pressure on the Japanese papers to not cover uh, Fukushima Daiichi accident issues, but but I really got to give credit to um, the the editors and the reporters at uh, Asahi Shinbun. That's a, a major newspaper in Japan. They did a gutsy three part series about the fact that contractors working for the Japanese government were not de decontaminating and storing nuclear waste. They were collecting the, the, the nuclear material, leaves and trees and dirt from houses and roads, and they were taking those leaves and trees and either dumping them deeper into the forest, because they're only cleaning about 40 feet on every side of every road, but they're either taking the leaves and trees and, and contaminated soil and putting it in the forest, or they're actually taking it down to the river and throwing it in the river. There's documented cases now by, by the Asahi Shinbun reporters showing the rivers uh, turning brown because they had thrown so much radioactive dirt and radioactive leaves into them. It's a big deal. You know, it really speaks to a, a lack of caring for your fellow citizens when you're contracted and paid to take this and store it. And in fact, you throw it in the river and let it float down to the next village. So these workers were contractors, but who were they contracted by? Who gave the orders for them to uh, shuffle this nuclear waste around in the environment rather than bagging it and disposing of it properly? Yeah, the, the, the Japanese government let contracts with major construction companies. A lot of those same construction companies are also working at Fukushima Daiichi, which makes you question what they're doing there as well. But the management of those companies instructed their workers to ignore the contract. The contract from Japan said you're to put it in bags, you're to store the bags, we'll take care of it, we'll put it into a, a waste facility that, at a yet undetermined location. But rather than put it in bags and store it, these workers, under, under permission and encouragement from their own management, uh, took these bags and threw them in the, uh, in the rivers or deeper in the, in the forest only to contaminate the land all over again. You know, a worker said, uh, the, the uh, Asahi uh, Shinbun reporters confronted the worker, the one worker, and, and he said, I regret what I did, but management told me to do it. Well, I don't, I don't think he regretted what he did. I think he regretted getting caught. 
which of course is, is, is a little bit different in my mind. We're posting all the links to this uh, Asahi uh, Shinbun stories uh, uh, next to this podcast on the site so that viewers can go in and read the, the gory details. But uh, I do have to give credit to a, a, a devoted team of reporters. They spent 130 hours sitting in the woods with cameras taking pictures of these problems. They did a really good job. Arnie, exactly how radioactive is this waste that we're talking about? Well, the newspaper story doesn't talk about it, but I'm sure it's at least as bad as what I detected when I was in Tokyo, which was you know, 7,500 becquerels per kilogram. That's of cesium, and I'm sure there are other isotopes as well. This was definitely radioactive waste, and if it were in the United States, we'd ship this waste to Texas, and we'd store it in, um, in trenches that then get covered over in one of the driest parts of the planet. But, of course, Fukushima Prefecture has an awful lot of rain, and uh, by, by just pushing this stuff deeper into the forest or dumping it into the river, they're just they're, they're making the problem worse. So certainly radioactive enough to tip off sensors. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. Their handheld radiation detectors would be uh, would be chirping like canaries in a in a coal mine. Well, Arnie, this is amazing information. I mean, is this is this in your mind an isolated event? Has something like this ever happened before? Well, in Japan, it's the first time that a, a major newspaper has reported on it. Yeah, uh, but but no, it's happened before. It's happened before right here in the United States. I, I don't think we should be too too rough on the on the Japanese on this issue where there's a, a long record of radiation cover-ups here in the United States. I'll give you three examples. There's, there's one in California called the, the Santa Susana nuclear accident. Uh, that was covered up for decades. There's one in, uh, in Florida right near the uh, Fort St. Lucie uh, reactors that were, uh, were covered up by the NRC. We'll, we'll talk about those later in the year. But uh, the one I wanted to mention uh, today is the cover-up that, that I was aware of. It happened in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And back in 83, I was a vice president in charge of a division that did decontamination. And the Department of Energy invited us and one other company, there was only two companies involved because it was pretty specialized work, to, um, to come down and put a bid in on something called the Princeton Avenue Plutonium Laboratory. And so Princeton Avenue is a road in New Brunswick, and on it was, a, uh, was an old uh, concrete building from the Manhattan Project that they had done research on plutonium. And we were invited to, uh, to knock it down in a controlled manner using all the kind of things you do when you're handling radioactive material. So I went in the building, and the highly contaminated portions of the building had been chiseled out. You could see in the walls where they had chiseled out pieces of concrete where there was very extraordinarily radioactive. But the rest of the building then had to be dismantled. And, and I had an engineer with me, and I sent him down to the uh, town hall in, in New Brunswick, and I said, you know, maybe we can find the drawings on this plant from the war years and see if they ever apply for a building permit. Well, son of a gun, the guy comes back about an hour and a half later with the drawings. And they showed not just the building, which we had the drawings for, but they showed sewage drain lines out of the building directly into the sewage treatment lines that ran down Princeton Avenue. So the sewage lines in New Brunswick were receiving all this radioactive contamination from this plutonium lab. Well, I showed the drawings to the uh, Department of Main Lines in the ground uh, under this uh, facility. Then he said, we have to cancel this, uh, uh, this meeting, and based on this new information, we'll have to come back out for bids at a later date. So I, I was fine with that, and the other contractor left too, and uh, I didn't hear back from the Department of Energy and didn't hear back, and about a year later, I was driving down the New Jersey Turnpike coming back from Pennsylvania, and I decided to get off in New Brunswick. So I drive down Princeton Avenue, and I can't find the lab. 
And where I thought it was, there was a blank field. So I drove up and down Princeton Avenue four times looking for this plutonium lab, and it wasn't there. It, it was gone. I don't know. It never went out for a bit. It was gone. Well, a couple of years later, I got to talk to the contractor, uh, the other contractor, and they had no knowledge of it either. So neither of us were told that they, that they knocked down the building. And then, geez, about 10 years ago, I was sitting in an airport, and this guy is sitting next to me, and we got talking, and it turns out he's from the Department of Energy, and he knows me. And we start talking about Princeton Avenue, and he said, I'm sorry, I can't tell you anything about it. It's classified. So there's an example uh, right here in, 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 my God, the heart of a large city in, in New Jersey where a building just disappeared, and no one did the real remedial work to go into the sewage lines and find out exactly what the contamination was. So what you're saying is rather than coming in and investigating the problem or looking to see if it was leaking radiation into the sewage lines or into any of the neighboring areas through the sewage lines, they just uh, canceled the bidding process and made the whole thing disappear without a word. Yeah. So who are they? The, they is the United States government, but, but more specifically, it's the Department of Energy probably the most pro-nuclear portion of the federal government. You know, getting back to this, the issue and how this relates to Japan, the Asahi Shinbun reporters had the guts to, to stick with this story. I've talked to reporters in New Jersey numerous times about this, and the, uh, the mainstream media in New Jersey just doesn't seem interested in doing the, the good investigative reporting. That should be done to find out what the heck happened to this facility and uh, what is really in the sewers in New Brunswick. All very interesting. Arnie, you said that there were two things that upset you on your birthday. This story coming out of Japan being one of them. Uh, what was the other? Yeah, the other one is closer to home. It's, it's right here in the United States. Our listeners will remember I've spoken repeatedly since the flooding out in the Midwest last year about the Fort Calhoun nuclear plant. Well, the uh, NRC just released their inspection report of the facility, and it's, the problems at Fort Calhoun are much worse than the authorities are, are letting on. This inspection report talks about design documents, something called configuration management, and those are you know, kind of make your eyes go bleary when you hear those words. But basically, if you remember, like airplanes have a book, and every single change to an airplane is in that book. Well, at Fort Calhoun, they don't have a book. They've got a room, a huge room with all of the drawings, and they don't know what's in it. They've lost control of their configuration management system. They're finding that documents are missing, and then some of the ones they find are incomplete, in other words, some pages are missing. And then when they look at the pages that they've got, they find out that the calculations are wrong. Well, all of this has come to light now in, a, uh, in an inspection report from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And, and I thought I'd use this opportunity to just read a couple of sentences from that report. The NRC has become aware of a concern among Fort Calhoun Station personnel regarding the historical quality of design bases documents in general. Now, what, the, what they're not saying there is that this problem started in 1985. So for 30 years almost, these documents have been missing, incomplete, or wrong, and the Fort Calhoun people have known about it, and now the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is just becoming aware of the problem. Another sentence in the thing is uh, Fort Calhoun's root cause analysis uh, conducted in 2012 concluded, quote, the barriers of reliable design and licensing design basis documents failed. Now, the NRC goes on, though, and it says, quote, however, the, the root cause analysis failed to recognize that this is a longstanding problem and it violates quality procedures. But we could go on, but, but the report is very, very damning. And, it, you know, it's, uh, it's as if um, I tried to sell you a new car, and I said, to, but we can't find all the drawings on the brake system, and we're not sure about the completeness of the calculations for the airbags, and 
oh, by the way, the calculations on the seat belts are wrong, but we want you to drive this thing anyway. You know, who in his right mind would allow that? And yet here's a nuclear plant that's, um, that's been operating for almost 40 years now, uh, and for at least the last 30 of it, they have known all along that they can't find out how it was ever built. So, Arnie, my understanding is that every nuclear plant, uh, as you're saying, comes with a, uh, a book, a history of every soldered joint, every pipe, every fitting, every weld, and all of those changes or modifications are kept in this sort of uh, quality assurance document or collection of documents. Um, my question is, without an accurate record of these changes, is a nuclear plant permitted to even run? You know, this isn't the first time a problem like this has happened at a nuclear plant where they lost configuration control. There's a plant in Ohio called the Zimmer plant, and they realized before it was ever started up that they couldn't figure out how it was built. They spent three years and over a billion dollars trying to reconstitute all this information and never could. The more they dug, the more problems they found. Ultimately, the Zimmer plant was never started, and it was a, a couple billion dollar loss. I think it's the same situation at Fort Calhoun. It's time to shut Fort Calhoun down. It's a small plant. They can do without the power. It hasn't been running for 18 months now, and Omaha's lights are still on. And in order to reconstitute this, it's going to cost more than building a brand new nuclear power plant. So the, the, the question is, though, why did we know about something in 1985 and not really discover it at the regulatory level until 2012? The NRC's got resident inspectors at every nuclear plant. So they've had two resident inspectors at Fort Calhoun since 1985, and they never heard that the design drawings were wrong? They never heard that the design calculations were missing? Come on, I don't believe that. And also, there's another organization called INPO, the Institute for Nuclear Preparedness Operations, and it's supposed to be tougher than the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Well, where the heck were they for the last 30 years? How can a design deficiency of this magnitude go undetected by the regulator and by the industry tough guy, INPO, for 30 years? My conclusion is they weren't looking. And, and that speaks volumes to the broader issue of nuclear regulation. But Arnie, now that they have looked and identified this problem, are they allowed to continue operating? Well, the NRC has never shut down a nuclear plant. The NRC has um, forced uh, plants to continue to reanalyze the design bases, et cetera. And ultimately, what's happened to several nuclear plants is the, they, the plant has thrown in the towel. They said, it doesn't make economic sense for us to, shut this, to keep this plant running, so it's time to shut it down. The NRC has never said, you lose your license because of what you did. The NRC has said, well, in order to come back up, you need to do this, 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 and this. That's really where we're at at Fort Calhoun, and I hope that the Fort Calhoun management will take a look at the mountain of problems that they face and say, this plant is not safe, we can't prove it's safe, and it's time to do a nice orderly shutdown and go about our lives with a different form of power. Arnie, you've had quite a bit to say about nuclear plants in the U.S. and how financially viable they are. Now, just recently, UBS Financial did their own analysis of several nuclear plants in the U.S. and came back with some information. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've been saying on this, the, the, these podcasts all along that some of these old single-unit plants like Vermont Yankee or Oyster Creek or, or Fort Calhoun they should be shut down because they make no economic sense. Long-time viewers will have haven't heard me say that likely for the last 18 months. Well, UBS Financial is a, is a security analyst firm, and they came out just this week a, a report that basically says the same thing. It focused on reactors owned by Entergy, and specifically on Vermont Yankee, and they said they can't figure out how continuing to operate Vermont Yankee makes any economic sense 
They also said that if they were Entergy, they would pull the plug and shut it down. Uh, I also think that the Palisades plant, which is in Michigan, uh, also an Entergy plant, old, small, uh, run down, is likely to face the exact same problem. So um, it's interesting to see the financial community coming to the same conclusion that I did. Well, Arnie, what a way to start 2013, and what a way to celebrate your birthday with all of this news. Yeah, well, there never seems to be a shortage of stories to talk about on these podcasts, and I'm sure that will continue all the way through 2013. You know, I, I'd like to, again, thank the, uh, to thank the editors and the, and the reporters at Asahi Shinbun, and also especially I'd like to thank the, uh, the viewers and listeners to these podcasts who contributed to the, uh, the fund drive we had last month. Uh, thank you. We're sure we can keep you informed for another year. All right, Arnie Gunderson, thanks again so much for joining us, and happy 2 to the 6th. Okay, Kevin, thanks. Well, that does it for this week's edition of the Energy Education Podcast. Remember, you can catch us back here next Sunday and every Sunday for more on what's going on in the world of nuclear news. For the Energy Project Manager, and, and he almost went white, and he had no idea there were